Good morning and welcome to the Back to the Future series. We'll get started here in just a minute. But for introductions, I'm John Harrison, your Europe, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, secure NETSEC uh, evangelist and Unit 42. I'm here today. I've got the rock star Chris Monday, and he's he's going to be helping out as well. And I'm excited to talk about uh, an exciting topic. But really what this series is, is looking back at technology and the evolution, looking at how Palo Alto Network's current technology solves these challenges that you're up to. This is content created by practitioners for practitioners, removing the marketing folks out of this. This is a weekly cadence call will be recorded and available afterwards. Feel free to send invitations to friends and colleagues. Questions, please. We've got a lot of awesome folks here covering Q&A and the panel will respond to questions. So let's go ahead on to the next slide and we can see, because I think we've, we've covered some really amazing um, sessions here so far. So we've covered app ID, TLS inspection, we had SaaS application control, the evolution or evolution of IPS. And we had Matt Smith last, last week with the evolution of sandboxing and then we've got some amazing upcoming uh, sessions with uh, after this. But uh, let's uh, go ahead. Let's show the next slide because we will be having um, a uh, having a quiz on there with some amazing prizes to win. So please use the Menti QR code here to go ahead and get things started and make sure you've got it all up and going on your phone. And then we'll uh, go ahead and kick that off. The, um, the topic today is inline and at rest DLP with Alex Bacic, and I'm excited to have Alex with me today. So let me turn it over to Alex, and we've got an exciting uh, session for you today. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. That's a very good introduction. So much appreciated, and you pronounced my name correctly. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Alex Bacic. Uh, I've been a systems engineer here at Palo Alto Networks for uh, over three years. So I'm sort of seasoned uh, in, in these things. Um, I've been in cybersecurity since about 2002, um, and I'm CISP and CIPPE, which is European Data Protection uh, Certification. Um, I've been certified there for, for a number of years as well. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about uh, data loss prevention and why we need to talk about data loss prevention and how it can help you embrace the cloud in a secure and compliant manner. So this presentation is about giving you peace of mind to leverage uh, the new way that we uh, use cloud applications and, and SaaS. So first of all, let's take a look at some of the um, some of the, the numbers. Um, so we know that uh, SaaS has exploded um, so we know that most people are moving to SaaS. We know that that creates um, targets because data is being stored in the cloud. Um, and, that, and we know that there are some misconfigurations that have caused uh, data breaches in the past. Um, and we know that that's, that's a bigger target. So essentially, we know the risks are there. So we know why we have to do this. We have to do this in order to um, to bring us a secure uh, 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 way of embracing the cloud. So we live in a data-driven world, and corporate data is referred to as the lifeblood of an organization. But what do we mean by corporate data? Well, we mean data like employee or customer personally identifiable information, PII. We mean sensitive financial data or any intellectual property. And we know that the consequences of an accidental or deliberate data leakage um, can cause a company to fail. So like Vastamo, Finnish healthcare company, like Wonga in the UK that uh, wound up after 23 million pounds of fines. Uh, but even if they don't fail, companies suffer from reputational damage, legal liabilities and compromised customer trust. Now, data loss can result from any number of failures, like from software glitches, accidental human error, but undoubtedly the biggest risk is from the outside. So that's cyber threats or from a malicious insider. And sometimes those are combined by a malicious outsider convincing uh, an insider 
to uh, share compromised credentials, that sort of thing. We're seeing that increasingly in the ransomware world. And what do we mean by DLP? Well, data loss prevention is essentially the, the antithesis to that. So um, we're, we're trying to prevent that. But, but before we get there, what about uh, insurance? Aren't, aren't companies insured against data loss? Well, internet-based risks, that's risks relating to information technology, infrastructure, and activity. Well, they're excluded from general liability policies. So that means you have to buy specialized cyber insurance, which is going up, uh, the premiums are going up by 133% per year. So, you know, the premiums are massive. And in fact, one of the factors in reducing those premiums, if you can, is whether you not whether or not you have in GDPR speak the appropriate technical and organizational measures in place to reduce risk like a DLP program, like showing how you manage information security, ISO 27001, for example. So data loss prevention can assist you in, in ensuring your organization. So what is data loss prevention? It's a tool that reduces the probability of data loss measurably over time. It combines uh, data classification, monitoring and enforcement mechanisms to prevent sensitive data from being mishandled intentionally or unintentionally. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. We'll go into all those definitions a little bit more later. Okay, DLP is a tool against data breach. So in addition to your threat prevention layers, your, your endpoint protection, your perhaps your firewall, your, your, your web gateway, those keep kind of the bad stuff out. And I think the DLP is a tool to keep the good stuff in. Right, so it works both ways. So for a malicious insider, it stops them from leaking data out. But from a threat actor acting externally, once they've compromised an internal host, the first thing they're going to try and do is they're going to try and get data out. So DLP is a tool against data breaches in both directions. Ransomware, for example, um, key risk for any organization. And the most prominent ransomware group right now is Lockbit3. So they just published last week 9 million patient records from a dental insurance company in the US. Um, they, they exfiltrated 700 gig of data and they wanted $10 million ransom. Um, in my own country, Ireland, Arm Assist, a uh, vehicle fleet management service suffered. Um, we're seeing a huge amount of these types of uh, extortion. Uh, and we're now seeing quadruple extortion or in addition to encryption and data theft, so getting the data out and stopping the company from using it once, once, once the ransomware attack has been executed, we're also seeing denial of service then as leverage to get the ransom. And then we're also seeing harassment uh, where cyber criminals contact customers, business partners and employees, and even media to tell them that the organization was hacked. Um, so, you know, we, we, we see this kind of quadruple extortion increasingly, okay? And at the end of the day, you're going to see these these types of files. This is what we mean by PII. So this it's it's the documents in your in your folders. It's the, the documents in your OneDrive folder. And these are the kind of documents you do not want to see being leaked on the internet. Okay. So DLP is just another layer against this type of theft and extortion. Okay, keeping the good stuff in. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about data governance because there's a lot of data governance standards out there. The great thing about standards is there are so many to choose from, right? So um, there are many competing privacy governance bodies, many overlapping data protection frameworks that have been established, but they all attempt to ensure the privacy and a security of personal data. So we've got principles like fair information practice that covers the right of individuals around notice, choice, consent, data subject access, so, you know, a customer putting forward a subject access request, for example. Then you've got laws and regulations like GDPR, um, which covers things like DPO, the data protection officer responsibilities, special category data, like, for example, minors. Um, and then you've got frameworks like ASACA's COVID 2019. So at Palo Alto Networks, we have predefined data filtering profiles that come with DLP out of the box. Okay, so you can you can apply these regulations right out of the box without having to write any new uh, any new policies. 
And then with our SaaS security posture management, we actually map some of these risks with your sanctioned applications to things like uh, NIST, ISO 20001, PCI DSS, and SOC 2. Okay, so these are risks such as uh, weak IAM controls, uh, permissions, those types of things. So we have, we have um, solutions for a lot of these types of uh, challenges. Okay, so how has preventing data loss changed over time? Well, we know that the modern enterprise is highly distributed. We know that organizations are moving applications like on-prem data stores to the cloud because frankly it's cheaper but you also get to leverage uh, an easier deployment um easier management and and scale right so you can quickly scale um but that means that the data effectively now lies absolutely everywhere so you don't have your arms around the data anymore you don't own the application you don't own the infrastructure so how can you answer questions like, uh, you know, in what country is your customer's data being stored and processed? So subject access request comes in, where is my data stored? Who knows? It's, uh, it's in Azure, it's in Dropbox, right? Where is it stored? Um, we know that, that employees are demanding flexible ways of working. So they want a great user experience wherever they are. They won't accept security controls that cause friction when they're trying to do their job. And so data is everywhere. Um, and that introduces challenges when it comes to protecting your data. So um, like, for example, for mobile, uh, what data is being used and shared between applications? You need to be able to safeguard your information everywhere by keeping track of it. Um, and so the previous sort of iteration of DLP products, when I started working with DLP in around 2009, um, you know, before the iPhone was launched, those just aren't built for the modern way of working. That's just uh, a fact. Okay. Um, so what is data loss prevention? Okay. Um, again, just to reiterate, data loss prevention is a risk mitigation tool that reduces the risk of data loss measurably over time. So it's a program, not a feature. Okay. It's not a product that you can buy. It is a program, but you can put the appropriate technical measures in place to make it far, far easier. Um, one of the key principles of DLP is understanding how data is being used, and that tells you how you can protect it. So you've got this concept of data in use. So that's data that's actively being accessed or modified, processed, um, data in motion, data being transferred on the wire, for example, transferred up to OneDrive, for example, uh, and data at rest. That's data kept in persistent storage. Uh, like once that file has actually got to OneDrive, that's it in persistent storage, that's data at rest. Um, okay, so we've covered that. And then finally, just a, 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 a principle of data loss prevention should be that um, DLP programs, in, in my experience, tend to succeed when they have senior <clears throat> champions um, as well as stake, all stakeholders in the business, like the DPO, the risk and compliance, legal, and so on, they need to carefully assess the organization's data protection needs. Like what data do we need to protect? How do we classify it? Where is it stored? How do we control it? And they need to drive it. So they need to actually put it into action. So typically in the past, we may have seen uh, DLP programs that took months and months because you know, the, the tech was clunky, the integrations were difficult, um, and I'll, I'll show you uh, an example of that a little bit later, but that's moved on. So because everything's in the cloud now, it's actually quite a, a bit easier to implement these things because you don't have as many integration points. And a technology like Palo Alto Networks can help you do that. Okay, so a typical DLP program member is not necessarily 100% uh, technology, uh, in fact, um, it's about 90% of it is incident response. So what do you do after you've identified a potential um, DLP incident? What, we, what do we mean by a DLP incident? Well, um, any time we do a POV or a proof of value to a customer, what we typically find is we typically find the usual types of activities going on that, that happen in every organization. So we have, for example, 
um, an employee uh, wants to work at the weekend, they have a OneDrive personal account maybe, they just drag and drop from your corporate OneDrive into their personal OneDrive. These are the types of activities that we find, you know, day in, day out. Um, it's not necessarily malicious behavior, but it's behavior that perhaps you don't have visibility of and you don't have control over. And so we start by baselining and identifying these types of activities. We don't want to start by just blocking sensitive data from leaving, right? That, that would be too intrusive on business processes. Um, and it would, it, it, it would result in, 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 in friction uh, for people trying to do their jobs. So typically what we do then is we move to a remediation phase. And what that means is that we're fixing broken business processes. We're talking to our employees, in particular our partners, and we're telling them, well, look, we have sanctioned applications that we use. So for example, Microsoft OneDrive, maybe Google Drive, uh, maybe Teams, all of these applications are sanctioned. That means that we have full controls in place to prevent data loss. So we have those sanctioned applications and we want you to use those. Then on the other side, we have unsanctioned applications. We definitely don't want you to use file sharing applications that maybe have uh, risk associated with them, um, no identity controls, nothing like that. So we have those unsanctioned applications. We probably just want to block those. If we never want people, there's no, there's no valid business case to use those. Then in the middle, we have tolerated applications. So these are applications that aren't sanctioned. We don't have controls over them, but perhaps for one reason or another, we want our employees to be able to use them. But we want to be able, to, our employees to be able to use them in a secure and compliant manner. And I'll talk about one example a little bit later. So ChatGPT uh, and how we can put controls around data leaving the organization via that control channel. So once we've talked to our employees and our partners about what they should be doing, we then move on to a more stringent control. And this is where we see a lot of incidents go down. And this is sort of self-policing where we notify end users of what they're doing. So did you know you are transferring sensitive data out of the organization? Um, you know, please don't do this anymore. Uh, we find that the number of incidents plummet over this period. And this period can be quite short. And once we're happy that we've got a manageable number of incidents, we then move to a blocking or pre prevention phase where we're simply going to block really sensitive data from leaving. And Palo Alto Networks DLP can do this in a really smart way. So we can allow people, for example, to use tolerated applications for most data, but for really sensitive data, we can block it or we can alert on it or we can remediate it, meaning we can do things like tombstone a document if it's really sensitive data so delete the document place it in quarantine and leave behind a message for the user to say that this document has been quarantined okay so that's the typical dlp program and um, we're finding that you know people who adopt this type of approach generally are more successful in their dlp program okay so let's look at the distinction between a legacy DLP implementation. So this is the type of DLP implementation that, that I used to deliver. Um, it's frankly pretty horrible. Um, I personally have experience of people trying to deploy this over a period of about three years. So purchasing the product and three years later, they're finally beginning to uh, finish the, the integration. What, why does it take three years? Well, for one thing, the actual plumbing, the architecture, for a lot of these solutions was really terrible. So the database, for example, might have been a third party database like Oracle, licensable separately, uh, implemented separately. All of the integrations with the endpoint, uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, secure web gateway, the storage, they required custom integrations that relied on legacy protocols like ICAP, you know, really horrible, slow, protocol with tons of limitations. And most of these, uh, you know, features required third parties, uh, third party integrations, like for example, OCR. So, so this is a real example of just how hard it used to be. The tech has moved on a ton in the last sort of, you know, 10, 15 years. And so now we're finding that the implementations 
and it, crucially the updates and upgrades and maintenance um, is now pretty much instant. So what used to take sort of three years to implement is now pretty much as simple as standing up a tenant and then providing the correct credentials and API keys in order to integrate your applications. And of course, any Palo Alto Networks integrations, like your firewall, like our Prisma Access SASE product, they're just integrated out of the box. So there's almost no integration required. So cloud-based modern DLP solutions have a ton of benefits. So key implementation uh, benefit is, um, you know, we, we now combine inline, that's egress, and API-based DLP, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute. We can, we can cover every use case without recourse to kind of these clunky integrations where you're having to send files back and forth with ICAP and uh, you know, all this sort of, sort of messy integrations that break once you upgrade, upgrade servers and things like that. Um, but crucially on the operational phase, um, DLP <clears throat> used to be just really, really hard to, to operate. You know, every time you updated your, you know, your exchange server, remember that, you had to then update your DLP integration with that exchange server. It was intrusive to business practices, it used to cause a, a ton of downtime. And if you look at the right hand pane, I mean, you know, upgrading a DLP solution on prem was just a nightmare. I mean, it, it, it used to take months to do. So if you look at cloud based DLP, like the benefits there are huge. And Palo Alto Networks uh, Enterprise DLP is, is one of those products that really sort of leapfrogged a number of phases of development of these products. And while the legacy vendors have kind of, you know, tried to catch up, they've been built it, building their products on a sort of foundation of, of this type of implementation. And that's caused some just huge problems in the cloud world. And that's where um, products like Palo Alto Networks Enterprise DLP really shine because they've been built from the ground up to uh, to work alongside modern SaaS applications. Okay, so how would you use cloud DLP? Uh, how would you implement that um, like from a programmatic point of view? So the process of implementing DLP typically starts um, with by identifying data, identifying sensitive data. So what data does your organization store and process GDPR says that you've got to minimize that, that you've got to justify what you're storing. Um, but then it goes on about the technical uh, and appropriate technical and organizational measures to safeguard that data. So say, for example, um, you're storing credit card numbers. OK, so, um, you know, your PCI DSS, DSS, for example, maybe you're governed uh, from a regulatory point of view. Maybe you have social security numbers. Um, maybe you're, you've got proprietary business information, like just customer IDs, names, addresses, and PII. So first of all, we need to identify that data wherever it's stored. And we can use, um, you know, basic techniques such as pattern matching. Um, we can do regular expression matching. We can do more sophisticated, uh, matching, like we can do exact data matching or matching say for example elements from your customer database we can match that uh, we can also use machine learning techniques we can even do things like we can um I, we can do optical character recognition where we're pulling uh data out of scanned images for example that are attachments things like that so that's identification once we've identified the sensitive data we want to classify that so, for example, into confidential, restricted, that sort of thing. And there are a number of tools that can help you do this. There's a ton of them out there. Um, they range from, you know, automated tools that go back to historical storages of data to user driven classification tools. But they all, um, the, the goal of all of them is to help organizations understand the level of protection that's required for the different types of data, the data labeling tools. So they're used in combination um, you know, with DLP to, to be able to identify the types of documents that we're talking about, the types of data we're talk, talking about. Uh, so for example, Microsoft AIP, uh, Titus, Bold and James, all of these are data classification tools that help you uh, with data governance, classifying your data. 
Um, they all store tags and document metadata, for example, so that uh, products like Palo Alto Networks DLP can identify those tags and apply rules accordingly. So once you've classified your data, you then move on to monitoring for data compliance. Um, so we want to ensure that data, sensitive data is being used in accordance with your established policies and your data government's regulations, so PCI DSS, GDPR, whatever you want to do. And that includes monitoring data in transit as well as data at rest. So we want to be able to do it across all control channels. And then finally, we want to move to enforcement. And enforcement doesn't necessarily just mean blocking. It could just mean alerting on a DLP policy violation. But essentially what we want to do is we want to uh, ensure that when a violation of DLP policy is detected, your DLP system takes action to prevent data loss, to reduce the risk of data loss measurably over time. And um, so this could be blocking access to sensitive data, could be quarantining that data, it could be um, removing a global share on a document, for example. Those are all examples of enforcement uh, when it comes to DLP response. Okay. Palo Alto Networks Enterprise DLP includes everything that we've talked about as standard. So, um, in, you know, including all of the sort of the data uh, uh, detection techniques, uh, machine learning, NLP, uh, optical character recognition, they're all included. Okay, so everything that you you're talking about in this presentation um, is Palo Alto Networks technology. We don't have any OEM with legacy DLP vendors, for example. It's all our own intellectual property. It's all being rolled out as a single product. It's a single uh, cloud-based tenant covers all control panels, uh, all control panes with a single policy. So single policy goes up to the cloud, is enforced from there, and then all of your logs and alerts come down from that, uh, from that cloud-based tenant. So all of your DLP incidents come down from a single source wherever the, uh, the, um, the incident occurred. Okay. So effectively what we've done here is we sort of, as, as I said, we've, we've leapfrogged a lot of the legacy technologies. We've designed our data loss prevention tool from the ground up to cover uh, cloud-based applications and SaaS. So we, we've already, you know, for years we've had our SaaS security product. So we've been able to govern SaaS applications and put controls and, and management around them. Um, now we're extending that to DLP detections and, and, and our DLP product, which has been out for a couple of years now, has been helping our customers do that. Um, so, you know, safeguarding your information everywhere, uh, keeping track of it when it's in motion, at rest or in use. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, let's talk about how easy it is to actually create a DLP policy. Because remember what I said, 90% of DLP is about incident response. Incident response is about writing policies, uh, baselining them, seeing how many incidents come out, and then tweaking them to make sure that every policy we're seeing is a valid, uh, or every incident that we're seeing is a valid incident. We have no false positives or as low as possible, so that we don't get this sort of flood of DLP incidents resulting in you know, a lot of manual labor. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can automate some of the responses to those incidents in a minute. But let's look at, for example, how we can write a policy. Um, so in this instance, do not allow sales teams to store company presentations in. So how, we, how do we do that? When anyone familiar with the Palo Alto Network's firewall would probably recognize this is very similar to writing a firewall rule, right? Except instead of keeping the bad stuff out, we're keeping the good stuff in. So we're going to look at how we do that. Do not allow who, so we have attribution, store, we have the context of that transaction. So is it a OneDrive upload? It's, that's different to OneDrive share. Uh, what type of data? We have layer seven inspection into the content of the data. We can read document classification tags. We read the content of the document. We read file attachments, all of that. Uh, and where, so we understand SAS applications, we understand, are those SaaS applications risky or not? Where they're storing data, all of the context around that. That allows us to write these powerful 
uh, DLP statements. But remember, as I was said, I'd give you an example uh, using ChatGPT. So um, ChatGPT, as you know, is a large language model, uh, similar to uh, Llama or BERT or any of those. Uh, we all know they have one thing in common. Anything you share with them, you'll probably find, uh, you know, appearing on Reddit pretty shortly. Um, so in this example, um, we have an organization that wants, uh, you know, probably would like to block ChatGPT, uh, let's be honest, as an unsanctioned application. But there are, you know, there are pretty good reasons why you'd want to use it. And, and certainly you wouldn't want to cause your business to sort of fall behind in terms of competitiveness because you were stopping your employees from using a, a tool like ChatGPT. So what we can do is using uh, Palo Alto Networks DLP, we can prevent sensitive data from leaking via ChatGPT, okay? So the first thing we can do is we can uh, use uh, our available tools um, to see what the historical ChatGPT usage has been like. And if you look at the left, for example, you can see uh, historically we've had a bit of data going up and down through ChatGPT. So two users have accessed that, and we can see the context around ChatGPT. Do they have, you know, a data retention policy? Are they encrypting? All that type of stuff. So we, we can understand a little bit about ChatGPT from there. Um, our firewall, of course, understands ChatGPT. We have really, really good data classification. It's called uh, App ID. Um, so we understand ChatGPT is a uh, on the wire, we can see what's happening there. So we could block this, but we want to allow this, but we want to put controls around it. So what do we do? Well, we can build detection logic. Uh, in here, if you look at the left, you can see that we're using social security numbers. We're also using AWS secret keys. And depending on the number of secret keys, we're gonna um, have a, a low priority incident for secret keys generally but we want a high priority incident for AWS keys specifically, because those are really, really important to us. And on the right-hand side, you can see, we're only going to apply this rule to ChatGPT, okay? Then we're going to set the action to block, okay? So where sensitive data is involved for ChatGPT, we definitely want to block that, right? We want to allow it for everything else, but for sensitive data, like uh, we do not want people to be pasting AWS keys into ChatGPT. So what will the user see when they try and do this? Well, if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see that the user, you know, they won't just get a timeout or a horrible error or a browser refresh or something like that. They'll get a nice notification message that will tell you that something's wrong, okay? So they will have something that they could, that will tell them that something's going wrong right there in the browser. In addition to getting an email from their incident responder or being contacted or whatever they want to do. Okay, so that's an example of how we can use uh, Palo Alto Networks DLP to put controls around modern SaaS applications like ChatGPT. Okay, in summary, Palo Alto Networks DLP offers the industry's most comprehensive cloud delivered enterprise DLP solution to, available today. So it has coverage on network, cloud, and user, it has high efficacy. It's cloud delivered and there's stuff that we can do in the cloud that you can't do on a, on a non prem deployment simply because of the, you know, the physics of limited compute limited memory that sort of thing. We don't have those limitations in the cloud cloud delivered also means that we deploy in minutes, not months. Uh, and that leads to a more cost effective deployment and we found over the last couple of years, typically a three times lower TCO compared with legacy DLP. So if you look at comparable solutions, which typically tend to be built on uh, point solutions like CASB or secure web gateways in the cloud, those types of solutions do have DLP, but they don't cover everything, right? So our, our product covers absolutely everything, wherever your data is going, okay? So with that, I'm gonna finish up the presentation for now. Um, we're going to move on to an actual demo, and I'm going to demo a couple of use cases here, okay? Um, so I'm going to demo it live, so that means it's not pre-recorded. Um, I'm going to base it on a fictional employee in a fictional company called VistoQ. 
the fictional employee is called Lisa. Um, she is working from home, but she has a laptop secured with Prisma Access. Prisma Access is our SASE product, SASE being Secure Access Service Edge. It's a product that allows customers to uh, our, our, our customers, our employees, and their their branch offices, their their uh, their data centers to connect securely uh, wherever they are and apply threat prevention and data protection policies to those connections. Okay, so Lisa has that on her laptop, but she's got a bit of a problem. She needs to get some files to a partner, some urgent files. These are files which have um, what she thinks is kind of sensitive data, but it, you know, it's credit card numbers and, a, and an extract from a customer database. Um, she needs to get those to a partner and she's going to try and do that using what I think would be a fairly typical employee type of reaction to an urgent situation. So I'm going to jump into the demo now. So I minimize that. And uh, so this is Lisa's uh, laptop. Okay, so here, I uh, hope you can see that okay. Uh, she's got these two files. So she's got failed transactions partial. That's essentially failed transactions with credit card numbers in it. And then she's got, also got a customer database. Okay, so she's going to transfer these files now so that her partner can then grab these files from her. Okay, so in the past, in a previous organization, she's used one of the free file sharing sites out there. There's a ton of them, Mega, Pixel Drain. She's used Zippy Share in the past. And we know that Zippy Share, um, those of you that have used it, uh, has very little security controls around it. It doesn't have, uh, for example, it doesn't have uh, defined storage locations. So your data might be stored in any country in the world and doesn't have any uh, privacy controls. So the first thing she does is she tries to access Zippy Share. If I can spell it right, zippyshare.com. Okay. So we see straight away that that application is blocked. Why? It's an unsanctioned application. That means we definitely don't want anyone in the organization sharing any information with Zippy Share because it's unsanctioned. We know it's not secure. So this leaves Lisa in a bit of a spot because now she's got nowhere to upload her file. But then she remembers, well, she has a personal account with Box. So Box.com, popular file sharing site. Let's go to Box.com. She thinks perhaps I'll be able to upload my files there. So she goes to Box.com. Ah, there she sees her folder there. OK, so she's going to try and upload a failed transactions. Remember, this this includes credit card numbers, so it might be considered uh, it might be considered um, sensitive information. So she copies this file and she sees, ah, let's see now it's uploading. There we go. It was uploaded successfully. That's great. OK, why was that uploaded successfully? I wonder. This is a for for VistoQ, that's Lisa's organization. Um, this is a tolerated application. That means that we allow customers or employees to use it, but we we have controls around it. We've allowed that failed transactions partial file to upload because although it includes sensitive data, it's actually not that sensitive. It doesn't include things like customer database extracts. Now let's see what happens when we try and transfer the customer database extract. So again, I'm copying that file to one, to a box and you'll see I immediately get a failure, okay? So that's telling me that something's failed. Now, what's happening at the back end? Well, we've actually blocked that file from being uploaded altogether. So we've actually created an incident and I'm gonna show you that incident now. So if I pivot to the DLP, uh, to the DLP uh, tab, I can show you now what actually happens on the inside. Okay, so we're going to see two DLP incidents resulting from Lisa trying to upload those files. So it'll load in a second and you'll see here, here was the first one. Okay, remember this included credit card information. If I click on that incident as an incident responder, I can see here not only I can see that it was a, the action was alert. Remember, it wasn't blocked. Lisa was able to upload the file, but we do have an incident here. Why? Because the data profile was triggered. The actual file in question, I can download it here if I want to take a look at it. I've got full user date 
uh, and application context around that data. And I've actually got what we call a snippet here of the data with the credit card information highlighted. In the hacking world, these would be called FULLS, F-U-L-L-Z, because it includes CVV, address, first name, last name. These go for, I think, about a cent each on the, on the dark web. Um, but we can, with DLP, we can put controls around it. So you'll see some of these are blanked out. We actually um, can configure a DLP um, to, to essentially mask some of those numbers so that the data that we're storing is essentially secure, right? Because we're not, we're not actually storing the DLP platform, the entire credit card number or, uh, you know, or type of PII. And remember that for certain types of data for certain organizations, so for example, for healthcare uh, organizations, when it comes to special category data, like for example, mental health care for minors, some of this data is, is actually, it's, 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 you know, it's not possible to store that outside of, uh, outside of the uh, GDPR controls. And so we have these features built into Palo Alto Networks DLP so that those types of uh, concerns can be removed. Okay, let's look at the second incident, which actually did result in a block. Um, so, and again, bear in mind that these are, this application is not a sanctioned application. This is a tolerated application. Uh, that means that we allow our customers to use it, but we've put controls around how they use it. So because this was a, essentially a high, uh, a high uh, severity incident, uh, because it has sensitive data from our customer database. This is using exact data matching. That means we're pulling uh, the information out of uh, what's been uploaded and we're matching it against uh, a known customer database. And that's resulted in a block. And that's why Lisa got that upload failed message because we, we know that that's super sensitive information. We do not want that leaving. We want to not just alert uh, an incident responder, we want to actually block it in uh, as it's happening in motion. Okay, uh, let me just really quickly show you the policies that are built around that. And then finally, I'll show you what Lisa can do to, to fix this problem. So if we look at actual, uh, at the actual mechanics of how you build uh, uh, a DLP policy, um, so first of all, I'm going to show you the profile that was triggered. And remember, we've a ton of pre-built profiles. Uh, these are the predefined profiles that you can use right out of the box. It can be as simple as just applying the GDPR policy to everything. That would be a very simple way of, uh, of you know, implementing GDPR, essentially, showing that you have the appropriate technical controls to safeguard your data. But let's have a look at this particular policy. So PII and sensitive data. Okay, so here's the actual policy that was built. Uh, it's based around uh, data patterns, PII data patterns, and based around our customer database. Okay, so we can build up pretty sophisticated DLP uh, patterns that match uh, based on multiple rules in the same data profile. And that allows us then to create a rule. And that rule, uh, if I just jump to page four, this is the rule that governed it. And you can see that both for uploads and downloads for any type of file we want to alert and block at the same time and create a high severity incident. So that's why when you look at our uh, DLP incident, you'll see that DLP incident being uh, a high priority incident. Okay. All right. So that's an example of what the data loss prevention incident responder would see. Um, other remediation activities we could have, we can, we can have things like, uh, for example, with our API, we can tombstone those files, quarantine them. Um, we can do quite sophisticated things with our XOR platform. So we can automate, for example, some of these uh, incidents being responded to uh, where there's a large amount of data exfiltration, for example. We can disable things like uh, Azure accounts. Uh, so we can do, uh, quite wide ranging things. We also have a Slack bot that you can interact with, for example, so that we can raise a DLP incident via Slack. It means you don't have to log into your uh, DLP dashboard to see the incident. All of these controls are available, again, all included with our DLP product. 
So just to wrap up Lisa's experience then, so what does she do? Well, now she's kind of really had to think about it. Uh, she's getting quite, uh, it's getting quite urgent now. So then she remembers uh, that VistoQ uses OneDrive, right? So OneDrive is our DL, is our sanctioned application that we want our employees and partners to use. Why do we want them to use OneDrive? Well, because we've got full control over the tenant. We have got full you know, data protection policies in there governed by Palo Alto Networks DLP. So if I just, uh, actually I'll just uh, jump to OneDrive here. So this is the company sanctioned OneDrive, okay? So let's just see now, when I try and upload the files one by one, you'll see that this, as this is a sanctioned application, uh, sorry, let me just uh, upload here. Actually, uh, there we go, let's go to the desktop. Uh, sorry, one second. I'm in the wrong folder, there we go. Let's just make sure I can create a folder here, for example. Yes, I should be able to. Um, I'm not sure why that's not visible on the desktop. Let me just uh, try dragging it again. Okay, not sure why OneDrive has been working today. So OneDrive is a SharePoint uh, type application on the web. I should be able to copy those files. Okay, apologies guys, uh, dangers of live demo. So what I should be able to do there, I'm not sure why, the, maybe it, perhaps it's the browser. Uh, let me just close out of the browser and open it again. What Lisa should be able to do here is she should be able to upload all of her files to OneDrive because it is a sanctioned application. Let's just try it one more time. I ah, see. Okay, maybe there's a problem with that SharePoint application, right? So that's what that there's an issue with the SharePoint itself. Oh no, there we go. Okay, so let's just try one more time. Dragging and dropping. No. Okay, let's leave it there. But essentially, what we should be able to see is we should be able to see Lisa is able to upload those files to OneDrive because it is a sanctioned application. And um, it's part of it. There's a, a, a business process that we want Lisa to be able to follow, which is to share those files with partners, provided she's following data protection rules. OK, so that concludes that presentation. Thank you very, very much uh, for your time. I'm going to hand back to you, John, now, if that's OK. Uh, so thanks a million, everybody. Very nice talking to you today. No, thanks. Thanks so much. I mean, that was that was great seeing the the live real time demo. <laughs> Alex definitely put you on the spot with the uh, the demo gods, and I think you know I picked up on a couple things. And so, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and your direct history, legacy DLP can be um, challenging. <laughs> I definitely picked up on that, and I I love with the network security uh, platform enabling. Uh, the enterprise DLP can be as simple as just really turning it on. So whether you're using our firewalls or VM series, CN series, or Prisma Access, right? It's it's easily to enable, it's easily kept updatable, and it's super powerful. And I shared in the uh, the chat, you know, I love the fact that you did the chat GPT uh, demos. Uh, so that that was great. I also posted in the uh, chat a number of things right there. So this really connects it. And I like, you know, from the, you said from the incident responders perspective as well. So each of the capabilities and things like that, that ties back to app ID, SAS visibility and control, which we've already covered, uses the DLP on top of that. So that, again, at each stage of the attack lifecycle, you want multiple attempts to stop the attacker instead of just ticking the box. Yeah, I got one of those products. I got one of those products. Got one of those products. Um, if you can go on to the... Uh, any anything else is a great summary or wrap up, uh, Alex? Uh, no, I think you covered everything, John. I think I think I just to reiterate your point. Anyone who's been involved with DLP implementation over the last sort of 10, 15 years will know that now the technology for DLP has moved on, um, and it's actually much easier to implement a DLP strategy now yeah. than it was perhaps yeah. 10 years ago. Well, well, especially as your perimeter may have changed, and that's one of the things instead of you know, backhauling traffic back to the data center where the DLP system is, you know, having it where your employees are as part of your SAS or your uh, Prisma Access solution, that's fantastic. So a couple of call to actions is, you know, each one of these capabilities, you can try the cloud-delivered security service ultimate test drive right here. 
we have our, if you're an existing Palo Alto Networks customer, or, or if you've, you're not, I'm sure that the account teams would be glad to help out, you know, try our DLP uh, free right there. Um, and then the next call to action, again, do you have confidence in your existing cybersecurity controls? This is a, you know, you can ask your account team or Palo Alto Networks partner to run a, a security lifecycle review to give you visibility into every application in your environment. Have, you know, as we talked about, uh, in advanced wildfire or advanced threat prevention. Do you have Cobalt Strike leaving your network? Do you have malicious DNS queries? The Beacon Learning uh, Portal has a lot of fantastic things going on. But I think it's, uh, you know, uh, we're going to go ahead and Chris, are we going to move over to the uh, Menti uh, quiz? Is this a good time? No. And do we? Yeah, yeah we will. Um, but also, like, guys, if you could fill out the survey, if you want to contact sales or if you want sales to contact you, please do. Um, on the survey, there's also a request for anything else you'd like to hear from us about. You know, we see requests for Panorama. We see some stuff around best practice assessment, which we'll cover in, in a, a future webinar. Um, please don't post as anonymous because we can't come back to you. So <laughs> your name uh, and your contact details and, and clearly we'll get back to you. But you are right, John. We are into oh. the quiz. Uh, oh, oh, actually, sorry. yeah, actually next, next, right, next week, week, we've got a fantastic session with Doug and Cohen on URL filtering and DNS security. And again, these are two fantastic technologies that have evolved so much and are again, essential parts in the kind of modern web and attack prevention. So you'll you hear if you're relying on traditional kind of old school technologies, you know, the the evolution has really evolved and these guys are, are going to be covering some fantastic sessions here. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great presentation. So I've already seen the uh, the first draft of that one. So I'm looking forward to that one. So on to uh, quiz winners. Oh yeah. Yeah. So look, from, from last week, uh, we have the Evolution of Sandboxing quiz winners. And I will say it again, please, Palo Alto people, do not participate in the quiz. That means even if you're in the Academy program, do not participate. So this will look a bit weird, but uh, again, we're back to <laughs> we're back to this. So uh, that, without further ado, we'll crack on. So in third place was Tom Edwards. Congratulations, Tom. We will go and find your details and we will send you an email. By the way, these um, these emails take a little while to come out. They come out from an agency. They're not coming directly from us. So don't be worried if you don't hear from us for a couple of weeks. If you're a winner, we will get to you. You are on the list. Um, the second place prize goes to Jeremy Doling. So congratulations, Jeremy. Well oh, done. nice. Yeah. The, and the, these were not easy questions, were they? they, were <laughs> so, not. they so these are good. Yeah, they were long as well. So, so Matt spent some time writing those questions. He uh, he didn't make them short. Okay, so the actual second place will hide, but first place goes to Chris Lim. Congratulations, Chris! Oh, right. That was a great result. You you were the qu clear winner actually by quite some distance on on speed and accuracy. So, so congratulations, guys. Um, we will be in touch. Uh, as of every week, we say, if you're a winner, you will get an email that looks like this. If you are not a winner, it's probably phishing. So don't click on it. All right. So uh, just just be aware of that, and it will we'll figure out where it comes from. It might be from tre tremendous. It might be from a different um, a different part. Of it. But either way, uh, it will look like this. So without further ado, we will move on to the Menti quiz. I will stop sharing just for a moment. I will put the QR code back up. Yeah, um, I, paste, I pasted it in the chat anyway. Again menti.com yeah. and then the code code right there that just went out to everyone while you're getting that up and going cool cool cool, cool. all right let's share again and again i, I want to just th thank everyone for for joining in this we had uh, so many people joining and uh, interested in this topic and and the previous topics as well the yeah. recordings will be posted uh and again uh, as alex's demo some of you may have, it may have been a little blurry you'll see the demo uh, nicely in the on-demand recording. A hundred percent. Okay, look, I'll leave this uh, slide up for a little while. If you could, when you join, please join with first name, last name, or or how you've joined the webinar. Um, we struggle with people that just use single letters and and personal emails and things. If you can join with first name, last name, or the names you registered with, then we can we can hunt you down and we can actually send you your prize money. If um, 
if we can't find you, I will try and and, and raise it on the next uh, webinar, and you can you can send me your personal contact details uh, one by one. Um, on other things, obviously invite friends, colleagues, anybody you think will be interested in this webinar series. Anybody that registers will get access to the the um, recordings so they can catch up. They'll also get added to the lists for future webinars that we are planning for um, after August. So those are in planning. Um, there is no, no restriction of, of who can join this call. Anybody can join. So anybody you think might be interested, please, please send it on. Um, We'll leave this up for just another minute and then we will get onto it. I'm very conscious of the time. Yeah, we've had some great topic suggestions as well. So I like, yeah. you know, everyone's had some really good things of other things we should be offering, not just, you know, as, as much as I love the network security and strata side of things, you know, getting into, you know, Cortex and Prisma Cloud and other things like that. Again, what are top of mind challenges you have? And Palo Alto Networks is really good at solving those hard problems and things that you're looking on. So. Okay. All right, team. I'm going to start the quiz. So we'll move on. So let's say we got 64, 66, 67. That's great. That's great. Right. Brilliant participation. Hopefully we can identify you all during this process. So I have double checked the quiz. Fingers crossed this will go smoothly today. Please no Palo Alto people. Um, it makes it very difficult for us in the back end to figure this out. Okay. All right. We'll We'll give it another second. I still see a couple more coming in, probably changing their names. Six, six, seven. When say when, John? Right, steady. Uh, let, let, let's go. Let's go ahead. This this looks great. People All are right, ready. Team. Okay, team. Look, good luck. Answer fast to get more points. DLP solutions can prevent data loss caused by both internal and external threats. True or false? I think we should see some fastest fingers on here. Oh yeah, everyone, everyone's got this down. Three of them down. Come on, correct. Fifty-seven of you are correct. <laughs> well done, team. Okay, look at how we did on the leaderboard. Oh, Peter Redmond, what happened? Did you leave? Uh, previous winner, Pete Redmond. Lucas Ooh. Ahmed, super oh, tight. Oh, and just so, so close. Wow. Super tight at the top. And Jeremy Doling in there as well. Okay, question two. Which statement about data classification is correct? Ooh, a bit slower this time. It's about excluding data from DLP scanning. Categorization of data based on its sensitivity or importance is the process of attributing owners to documents. Hmm. Good question. Yeah. You're paying attention to slide, I think, three of Alex's presentation. All right, 59 of you correct there. Good job, most people, most people. Getting it right. Okay, let's see what's done to the leaderboard. Wow, Lucas and Ahmed, very close. Oh, we've got a change wow, in the lead. Wow, super result there. Creating a 15 point gap as well. Nice one. And then Paul and Matt Beckett coming in, in the second and third. Congrats. Okay, here we go. Question three. Palo Alto Networks Enterprise DLP can detect sensitive credentials, including AWS secret keys, API access keys, and tokens and SSH keys. That's a mouthful. Who are false? Is that a bad thing if AWS secret keys, Azure API access tokens, and SSH private keys are, are leaving? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely we don't want that happening. Yeah, and again, oh, that, that never happens. And again, how many times do we see AWS secret keys posted in GitHub and things oh, like that? Yeah, GitHub, S3 buckets, you name it. It's everywhere. All right, but 62 of you right on that one. Good, good scores. Oh, let's see if we got a change in the leaderboard. Oh, Paul Mitchell, good result there as well. So uh -oh. board. Paul Mitchell takes the lead. Matthew oh, Mitchell. nice. And Steve James, congratulations. You were fastest. And I love your icon. Awesome. 
Excellent work. Okay, question four. Enterprise DLP can detect images that contain sensitive information, even embedded in PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. Sophie? Mm -hmm. Right, correct. 60 of you correct again. Um, I think there's the same five guys. I think they're messing with us, John. <laughs> Maybe those are some of the uh, academy folks. That's not, yeah, yeah. Just, 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 just kidding. I mean, Alex, these are, these are really good questions. These are really good. The, the optical character recognition part of this really comes into play. How do we have a change in the leadership? Let's see. Let's see what's happened. Oh, sorry, this one. Oh, and the leaderboard is. Lukash um, coming up in, in third place. He was fastest. Uh, Paul Mitchell, Matt Beckett staying, staying top two. But there's only two points in it between the top two. It's really tight at the top. Okay. Last question, question five of five. What is data called whilst it's being processed? Data in motion, data in use, data at rest. That's a good question. It is a good question. Simple ones off the now. All right, it is data in use. So data in motion is data transferring over the wire. Uh, and data at rest is data on big storage that's not being used. 27 of you got that right. And that was question five. So we don't give the game away just now. We're going to give that game away next week. <laughs> So look, thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thank you, Alex, for putting the presentation together. John, thank you for being the hostess with the hostess this week. Um, please, everyone, join us for next week's session on URL filtering and DNS security. Um, it's, it's a great session. Uh, there's a lot of content in it. It's a lot of good stuff that we do, which is absolutely unique and, and absolutely necessary in, in this world that we, we live in right now. Please forward this invite on to your friends. Follow me on LinkedIn. You will get a regular reminder of this session. Um, and yeah, look, thank you everybody so much for spending time with Palo Alto Networks. We appreciate every minute. We know they're precious um, and we shall hopefully see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks all.